It's Wednesday, October 12th, and this is now on HNN. I don't think there will be a recession. If it is, it'll be a very slight recession. New inflation numbers are out. We'll explain what they mean for you. Everybody that took the stand told the truth except for one. Conspiracy theorist Alex Jones is ordered to pay nearly a billion dollars to the families of Sandy Hook shooting victims. COVID booster shots are authorized for kids as young as five. They were Mahu. They were what we would call today transgendered, perhaps. Plus, in honor of Pride Month, an exhibit at the Bishop Museum shares the history of how Polynesia embraced those who were in between genders. These stories and more coming up on This Is Now. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Dylan Inchetta alongside Ashley Nagaoka in the H&N Digital Center. That's right. To our top story, new inflation numbers are out in the latest report from the U.S. Labor Department. Isabel Rosales joins us from Washington, D.C. to explain what they mean for you. <laughs> Ashley, there's a brand new report out from the Labor Department and the results, well, economists are calling them disappointing. It's raising concerns that all of these aggressive rate hikes that we've seen from the Federal Reserve, that they're not doing much of anything to take inflation and bring it under control. The Labor Department reporting a larger than expected increase Wednesday in the producer price index. The report gauges prices paid for goods and services before they reach you, the consumer. Energy was up a little under a percent in September. Food prices jumped 1.2 percent. And services are up about a half percent. While these increases represent the wholesale prices, they are likely to be passed on to the consumers in the form of higher grocery prices. Historical experience suggests that uh, the kind of inflation we have rarely returns to normal levels, to target levels of around 2 percent without some kind of recession. The fight to bring down decades high inflation has become a major concern for the Federal Reserve. The central bank has been hiking interest rates at an unprecedented pace in an effort to cool down the economy. But there are concerns that it's happening too fast and could soon lead to a recession. No, look, they've been saying this now how uh, every every six months they say this. President Joe Biden remains confident in the economy. I don't think there will be a recession. If it is, it'll be a very slight recession. Yeah, and tomorrow another big day with the more closely watched consumer price index that uh, those numbers will be released. That shows what consumers are paying for goods and services. One important factor to look out for here is oil prices. We saw with OPEC cutting oil production by 2 million barrels a day. Uh, those figures are likely to be reflected in the consumer price index. Ashley. Now, Isabel, how is the Federal Reserve likely to respond to this? Well, this is number one priority. Inflation is at a 40-year high. The central bank has been working for months now aggressively with these uh, rate hikes to sort of cool down the economy. But there's, there's a balance there. They're hoping for a soft landing uh, in a way to not plunge the economy all the way into a recession. Um, but some concerns from experts is that they're doing this too quickly and a recession is inevitable. This all means that the Fed is likely to raise those uh, interest rates again come November and come December. We're seeing from CEOs and economists that they are increasingly convinced we are headed to a recession. And we heard from the president himself just yesterday that he doesn't anticipate a recession, but there is a possibility, his words, of a very slight recession. I want to also show this to you, Ashley, a, a poll of public sentiment, CNN poll. 22 percent of people believe that the economic conditions right now are good, 41 somewhat poor. 37% believe that economic conditions are very poor, and 40% believe that conditions will be good in a year from now. Ashley. Isabel Rosales joining us from Washington, D.C. We appreciate the time. On Hawaii Island, police found a badly decomposed body of a man at a home in Mountain View. This happened yesterday on Lehua Street. The cause is unclear, but detectives believe foul play may be involved. Anyone with tips is asked to call police. Two weeks after Washington state authorities found the body of Hawaii Island woman Brandy Ibanez, an arrest has been made. Police have been holding her boyfriend, Richard Michael Jacobson, in Oregon on a 
felony fugitive warrant. Ibanez was 34 years old and grew up in Pahala. She left Hawaii in 2013. New at noon, a jury in Connecticut has ordered conspiracy theorist Alex Jones to pay $965 million to people who suffered from his false claim that the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting was a hoax. The verdict is the second big judgment against the InfoWars host for claiming the massacre was staged. It came in a lawsuit filed by the relatives of eight victims. Jones now believes the shooting was real, but he says he had a right to publicly question whether it happened. A Texas jury in August ordered Jones to pay $50 million to the parents of another slain child. Just hours after a former San Antonio police officer turned himself in for the shooting of an unarmed teen in a McDonald's parking lot, he is now out on $100,000 bond. Mike Valero has the latest on the investigation, and we must warn you, some of the images in this story are extremely graphic. Get out of the car. The tense moments in a McDonald's parking lot that led to a teen fighting for his life and brought charges against a now former San Antonio police officer captured on police body cam. The video was, was horrific. Uh, there's no question in anybody's mind looking at that video that the shooting is, is not justified. San Antonio's police chief says 17-year-old Eric Cantu wasn't a threat when he was eating in his car last week. Former officer James Brennan reported he thought that same car had evaded police the night before. We have a we have a policy that prohibits officers from shooting at vehicles, moving vehicles, uh, except if their life is an immediate their life or someone else's life is an immediate danger. Former officer Brennan is now facing first degree felony charges, two counts of aggravated assault by a public servant. This was a was a failure for one individual police officer. It had nothing to do with our policies. Our policies did not allow that. Our training did not, does not teach that. A statement from Contu's family reads, Eric is still on life support and is non-responsive, but his oxygen levels are showing an improvement. We are being patient and optimistic that better health is coming. Please continue to keep Eric in your thoughts and prayers. I'm Mike Valerio reporting. Joining us now is our HNN political reporter, Daryl Huff. Daryl, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. So you've been covering the gubernatorial campaigns. Tell us a little bit about how that's been going so far. Well, it's been interesting. You know, Duke Ayana is such an underdog in this race that um, when it comes to money, you know, Josh Green has spent millions. Ayana ba barely has cracked a few hundred thousand. Um, and then... Josh Green has basically avoided any series of debates. He has only agreed to one. So what we did was we decided to sit down with each candidate for a good half an hour to 40 minutes to go through all of the pertinent issues of the of the year so far. And we are doing, we're posting that on the internet, on our website, so people can see it complete unedited. You can see how they think. You can see what how they're processing issues. You can see how they communicate. Um, and now we're also breaking out the stories into individual issue stories. We've we started doing on Monday. Those are also going to be posted on the website, and we're going to do it through the end of the week. Mahalani Richardson did the interviews, and she and I are sharing the labor on doing those issue pieces. I know some of the highlights you folks have talked about so far was the stadium, housing, of course, an issue on everyone's mind, along with rail and sea level rise, and of course, abortion. Uh, give us a recap of those highlights. Okay, well, the, let's first talk about abortion, which has turned into a way more heated issue than it's ever been in Hawaii for years and years and years, because it's been legal in Hawaii for so long, yet the Supreme Court, by overturning Roe versus Wade, has essentially tossed that issue out across the country. And in Hawaii, the Democrats are finding ways to put Duke Iona and his running mate on the spot because they're very conservative on, on abortion. Duke Iona has been trying to say, look, that is not a relevant issue in Hawaii. It's legal in Hawaii. The legislature is not going to take it away. It's not going to become an issue for the governor. That's kind of a way of avoiding actually describing what his position is on abortion. But then now, just yesterday, Governor Ige issued an executive order, which is an order from a governor. So the next governor is going to have to either continue that order or change it, which means it's hard for Duke Iona now to say abortion is not relevant anymore in Hawaii. So there's a lot of interesting politics there. There is a genuine effort to protect um, practitioners from 
uh, you know, being prosecuted by other states. But the fact that the governor used an executive order to do that is uh, an interesting way of putting it back on the plate for the campaigns. Um, the other really bizarre issue that's popped up, and again, this is because of something Governor David Ige has done, is that this, what's going to happen to Aloha Stadium now. Everybody's concerned about it because it's taking so long and it's, you know, UH is struggling to get enough people to watch its games. Um, and there's a sense of urgency. But just a few weeks ago, the governor tossed a real curveball into the stadium by saying he no longer wants supports a public-private partnership, which would involve having private developers come in and pitch in a considerable amount of investment alongside the state's investment to build a stadium and an adjoining entertainment district. And so that huge project has been in the works for several years. And now the governor says, no, let's just do a straightforward, we've got enough money, a straightforward government project, build a stadium, build it as fast as we can, and then deal with development of the site later. Now that's really put both of the governor candidates in an awkward position, talking about an issue that they probably didn't think they were gonna have to worry about. And so we have some sound from those interviews about that. The site at Aloha Stadium, I, I think they put a lot of money into that, a lot of time into that. Um, you can do mixed use, you can do housing. I don't think it should just be one genre, though. I don't think it should just be solely housing or solely commercial. I think it needs to be uh, a mixed use. If there's not a housing component, then we're making a mistake. And so whether we go the route of having the university support it, they're going to have to also disposition some of that land to build housing. Or if we go through the private partnership, we can probably do it in a little bit more streamlined fashion. What I care about is that we not delay things 18 months. And the problem really deals with real estate understanding that the outside influences have driven up the price and the availability of homes. And so if you understand that you have to keep it local and you have to keep it tied to local wages, it can be solved. There'll be a housing czar in my administration in my office sitting next to me so that we don't let it slip. That's one. We've already promised 10,000 units in a first term if we're selected. And in order to do that, you have to get all of that housing that's been entitled back on track. Our H&N political reporter, Daryl Huff, joining us today in the H&N Digital Center. Daryl, thank you so much. Welcome, Don. Both the FDA and CDC have authorized COVID booster shots for kids between 5 and 11 years old. The shots are formulated to target Omicron variants. Americans 12 and older can already get those boosters. Honolulu is expanding free COVID testing for all Hawaii residents. Starting this weekend, you'll be able to get a free PCR test or rapid antigen test at the Daniel Keinoe International Airport. Also this weekend, the testing sites at Honolulu Hale and Kapolei Hale will revise their hours to be open from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Here's a QR code on your screen. Scan that with your phone and you'll be able to find out more details, including how to register for a test. Right, we're continuing our celebration of Honolulu Pride Month and cultures around the Pacific have long embraced people in between genders because they understand that gender identity can be fluid. In Hawaii, people with both male and female traits have traditionally been recognized as mahu. Yeah, and it wasn't looked down upon. In fact, it was respected. And now a Bishop Museum exhibit is highlighting just that while telling the ancient tale of four mysterious stones and the energy they're said to have. Thousands of people pass them every day. Very few of them know the true story of but what the stones represent. They are called the healer stones of Kapai Mahu. Legend says four ancient healers came to Hawaii sometime around the year 1500. They were Mahu. They were what we would call today transgendered, perhaps. They brought to the Hawaiian Islands with them healing knowledge that they had, and each of the four had specialized healing knowledge. They requested four large stones be moved from Kaimuki to Waikiki. The four healers imbued their powers into the stones, and then they vanished. Those stones are still present today in Waikiki. The stones have been documented throughout recent history, sitting on the property of Archibald Cleghorn, who outlines their protection in his will. In 1941, they were buried under a bowling alley that was torn down 21 years later. They were moved a few more times until resting at their current location next to HPD's Waikiki substation. So now, finally, they've been placed in a way that treats them with respect, that people can't 
touch them or try to put things on them. The Bishop Museum exhibit honors the story of the healers and the stones. It also explains that throughout the Pacific, genders other than just male and female are ingrained in culture. People who were sexually different, who, who identified differently, who looked different, were not the objects of scorn. They weren't pushed aside. They weren't hated. They were accepted as part of the normal sort of array of different types of human beings. And that's very true for the four Kapai Mahu healers. As the exhibit explains, part of the stone's history has been covered up. Some suppress the fact that the healers were Mahu. With the introduction of Christianity, with the introduction of Western morality and Western perceptions, starting in the late 1700s, people like the Kapai Mahu healers, people who are different, became not accepted but disliked, actively hated, suppressed. Brown says the purpose of the exhibit is to shed light on the full history of the legend. But we talk about healing. We talk about the development of Waikiki. We talk about entertainment. We talk about all kinds of things. So if somebody walks out of here having learned just one thing, whatever it may be, then we've succeeded. There are people who are Mahu, and there always have been, and there are now, and there always will be. Yeah, there are these people. Don't hate them, don't destroy them. Just accept them as part of everything that we are as humans. A strong message there from Bishop Museum historian DeSoto Brown. One super cool thing about that is he told me that part of that exhibit will actually live on at the Hawaii Convention Center. So if you didn't get a chance to see them, uh, they're open until, uh, I believe, Sunday. So go ahead and check it out. But after that, Hawaii Convention Center is where you can find them. Great story, Dylan. I had no Thank idea you. about those rock sculptures yeah. outside so of Hawaii. Yeah, so many people key. don't know the history of it. But now you know. That's awesome. <laughs> Great story. Thank All you. right, let's switch gears to weather. You're looking at Santa Monica, where the temperature is 68 degrees. We're going to check on our weather here at home. Let's send it over to Guy Hoggy. <laughs> For us, it's going to be a little bit sticky, right? Because of the light winds. And these light winds will be with us through tomorrow. Slowly, uh, take a look. On Friday, that's when the trade wind breeze starts to come back. And they'll firm up over the weekend. So the weekend is shaping up quite nice. Although, with the trade winds coming back, we'll likely see a few windward and Mauka showers. But the heavy rainfall that we see today, the spotty showers, especially late in the day, maybe even some thunderstorms, will ease up by Friday. And then those trade winds come back in. We'll see some windward and Mauka showers but more sunshine drier especially for leeward areas coming in time for the weekend so the weekend is looking good but we got to get through the hot sticky and wet conditions today and tomorrow all right let's see what the internet is talking about today now most painters wouldn't dream of destroying their masterpieces but that's exactly what one british artist is doing as ian lee reports it's part of this extravagant experiment this one's called Understanding Everything. Artist Damien Hurst shows off one of his famous spot paintings before tossing it into a fire at a London art gallery. His unusual flame-filled performance drew a crowd and plenty of questions too. I'm not burning my art, I'm transforming it. Transforming it into an NFT, a non-fungible token, a digital copy of the artwork that will live forever. But I think this has to be part of the process to create truly digital artworks is to destroy the physical artwork because the two can't exist at the same time. Hearst gave collectors of his 10,000 pieces of art a choice, keep the NFT or take home a physical copy. The NFTs are too new for me, um, whereas having something I can hold, I prefer that. About half of the buyers, including Kyle Johns, chose the NFT, sending his painting up in smoke. It's such a, a unique idea to bring into the art world. What did you think, though, about him destroying the actual painting? It's not destroying. It was cement in the fact that it's only going to be an NFT. But destroying or transforming, whatever you want to call it, is not easy for the artist. The, the better the title, the harder it is to burn it. This one's called All Love. This bizarre experiment was all meant to test the value of physical art versus digital. And which is worth more? I still don't know. And which is better? I still don't know. Creating a heated debate for collectors in the digital age.
Ian Lee, CBS News, London. So some notes from that story said the artwork he's burning is worth $11 million, which is a interesting lot. Quite because a bit. Uh, they all look the same, right? It was just like it's dots. dots. <laughs> what do we know about also, art? Also, you had me at art. I get the concept. You lost me at NFT. Right. Don't understand yeah. it. It's still a little too soon for me. Same. But, you know, to each his own, I guess. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so this was really exciting for me. Dylan had no idea what I was talking about. But it's somewhat of an idea. <laughs> here's some nostalgia for us 90s, early 2000s kids. So pop punk band Blink-182 is making a comeback for a world tour and a new album. So the group announced Mark Hoppus and Travis Barker will reunite with original member Tom DeLonge. Now, the band was formed back in 1992, and the trio says they're dropping a new single this Friday, and it's the first time the three have been in studio together in a decade. Tour tickets go on sale on Monday. Awesome. Very awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Loved Blink-182 yes, back in the day. Yes, yes. What else we got here um, today? So it's the holiday boozy treat you didn't know you needed. An ego-inspired cream liqueur or mm -mm. ego nog. Get it? So the holiday okay. liqueur <laughs> is a partnership between Kellogg, the ego waffle company, and a craft distillery. So the ego nog... Appalachian Sipping Cream is described as a rich rum-based liqueur with cinnamon and nutmeg. Kellogg said the alcoholic drink pairs perfectly with their fluffy waffles, yum, topped with whipped cream or ice cream. Yeah, because who doesn't want to eat alcohol or drink alcohol with their waffles in right, the morning, especially right. during Christmas, right? <laughs> so many wild <laughs> ideas out there. Um, but first, we're going to focus on Halloween because Jamie Lee Curtis returns to her iconic role in the Halloween franchise mm -hmm. in theaters and streaming this Friday on Peacock. Entertainment Tonight sat down with the star and Nichelle Turner joins us with the story. Nichelle? Aloha, Dylan. After 44 years and eight different appearances, Jamie Lee will say goodbye to Lori for the final time. And she told us that giving her up wasn't easy. It all ends now. Nothing in my life doesn't trace back to Lori Strode. And so to say goodbye to her permanently uh, is incredibly emotional. <laughs> then I am ultimately saying goodbye, if you're a fan, to you. I'm saying goodbye and I'm saying thank you all at the same time. Is this actually goodbye if another creative team picks up the... The thread? I mean, sure, there are people who, who might, but I, I don't think so. Like, it feels very complete to me. Jamie was all in, going head-to-head -head with Michael Myers for the last time. She even helped choreograph the final confrontation. Anything that's going to yeah. look raw and brutal. I just didn't want it to look like a movie fight. What I really want is something so unexpected and, and brutal that, that just people are gonna be like, wait, what? And it was where he grabs her hair and then pushes her face through a plate glass cabinet. And I said, I want it to be me. And it's in the movie. Is there a part of you thinking like, what have I, <laughs> what have I done? No, I don't shake it off the way I did when I was 19. And it, I, I certainly was, I knew I'd been in a fight the next day for sure. It's a horror movie. Don't you wanna see a battle? And tune into ET tonight for George Clooney, Julia Roberts, and The Rock inside their box office showdown. Plus, our Lenny Kravitz exclusive. Is he ready for his magic mic close up? For Entertainment Tonight, I'm Michelle Turner. Ooh, so exciting. Do you like horror movies? I don't. I don't either, but the <laughs> Halloween, it just gets me every time. Yeah. So I know I'll be watching it like this right. with one eye when I open. Exactly. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, thank you guys so much for watching today. That was This Is Now. I'm Dylan and Chetza alongside our Ashley Nagaoka. Have a wonderful afternoon. Be sure to tune in on KHNL first at 4. Aloha.